Hello, everyone, and welcome to Spex Sorter Prep's webinar on Chemistry and Cosmetics, the Analysis of Lipsticks for Toxic Elements Using ICPMS. I'm Matt Snyder, Marketing Associate for Spex Sorter Prep, and I'll be moderating the presentation today. Before we begin, I'd like to get a few housekeeping items out of the way. First off, everyone in attendance will receive a copy of the presentation slides. The webinar is also being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube account about a week after the event. Questions will be answered during a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. If you have any questions during the presentation, simply type them into the Q&A box on your screen. With that out of the way, I'd like to introduce our pre presenter, Pat Atkins. Pat is our product application specialist who's worked on a number of research projects and previous webinars, including BPA and phthalates in water and the chemistry of wine. Pat, the mic's all yours. Thank you, Matt. Good afternoon, everybody, and I uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon on our talk on uh, chemicals and lipstick. We like to take on special projects here at Specs just to kind of highlight uh, interesting finds in, in the world. You probably have seen some of our other work on, on pet food, on chocolate, uh, mercury in fish, phthalates in water bottles. So we like to do a little survey among the, our employees and find out what they're interested in, what they want to know about. And 50% uh, of our company here is made up of women. And uh, they all had an interest when we started discussing uh, heavy metals about lipstick. And in doing some research about uh, lipstick, I found that there have been some studies done on lead in lipstick. So that we thought it was a nice opportunity for us to kind of revisit that study and expand it a little bit and see if there was any toxic metals in the lipstick. One of the interesting things I got to do in preparing for the webinar and the presentation is find out the history of cosmetics and history of lipstick. It's a very uh, checkered past, our, our cosmetics history. Over time, cosmetics have traditionally and historically had toxic metals and toxic compounds. The Egyptians were infamous for having cosmetics made up of, of lead and mercury compounds. In particular, uh, the black that they put around their eyes, that coal, was an amalgamation of all sorts of different compounds, including burnt almonds, oxidized copper, uh, different copper-colored ores, leads, ash, arsenic, and ochre. So they had a whole variety of different uh, metals and compounds, uh, some of which were highly toxic, and they would put it around their eyes. I actually read a, a study very recently that there is some possibility that the coal around their eyes with the high lead content actually had a beneficial effect of keeping uh, bacteria away from the eye and therefore entering the body. So that was kind of an interesting positive side note for the use of lead in that coal eye makeup. Another makeup they used, which I'm not even going to try to pronounce, I'm sorry, uh, was a copper and lead ore. The Greeks and the Romans continued their little toxic uh, uh, cosmetic compounds with a white complexion powder or white complexion paste made up of lead and lead oxide. Uh, they used red colors such as cinnabar, which is a, a mercury compound, to, to rouge their cheeks and their lips, and they would use an antimony compound to darken and uh, define their brows. If you move into the medieval and renaissance period, there was a widespread use of a white complexion or the mask of youth, uh, a white paste or powder that was spread over the face, chest, hands, to give this white perfected porcelain doll, almost death-like uh, look to their complexion. And it was used both by men and women to get this kind of very uniform complexion. And it was a mixture of hydroxide, carbonate, and lead oxide. Infamously, this is a portrait of Elizabeth I. Uh, she used this uh, material to cover acne and pox scars with this heavy white makeup. She used it for many decades of her life to give her that porcelain-looking skin. And the side effect from the toxicity of, of this particular makeup was to cause her, her beautiful, historic red hair to fall out. So then she created a new fashion of wearing wigs to cover her bald head from losing her hair. The 20th century has not been without its uh, toxic cosmetics. At the turn of the century, the, the discovery of radium created a new market for this healthful glow, products with radium in them. 
1918, this is a uh, advertisement for Radium Cosmetics that was uh, in the newspapers in 1918. And I found it kind of interesting when I was reading it. It basically has a statements of this is an ever flowing fountain of youth and beauty, and it's been found in the energy rays of radium. When scientists discover radium, they hardly dream they had unearthed a revolutionary beauty secret. They now know it. Radium ra rays vitalize and energize all living tissue, and this energy has been turned into beauty's aid. And then they go on to guarantee that each tube of their cosmetic has an actual definite quantity of radium, and they get put a guarantee of $5,000 as proof towards the content of their radium. So this was a pretty expensive uh, high-end beauty product of its day, and when I was looking to find out, you know, how much this would have cost a, a woman trying to buy this in 1918, I found out that for the person in 1918, an average salary was $1,500 a year. The hourly salary rate was between 30 and 70 cents. And for a year's rent in the New York City era, you would pay about $178 for an apartment. So if you were a modern working girl on the eve of the roaring 20s, you would probably be paid on the low end of that scale, maybe 20 or 30 cents an hour for your, for your day's work. And your day would probably be about 10 to 12 hours long. So you would be earning between 2 and $4 for your day on the job, and then you would pay basically your day's worth, or pretty close to your day's worth of salary to obtain this uh, radium compact. I guess the only good thing is with the, the price of this, I'm, I'm sure it wasn't a widespread use of radium in, in cosmetics. Uh, that $2 compact would be like buying over a $50 or more compact now today. Now, other interesting uses at the turn of the century of radium were watch dials. Uh, watch dials used to be painted with radium as well, and there were a whole host of radium products from radium toothpaste, uh, radium youth aids. So it, radium was a, was a big deal at the turn of the century. Just in case you think we got smarter as we got older the country or got older in the world, in the 1930s they promoted radioactive cosmetics. This is a company out of France that promoted Thor Radia, and they actually had radiation in their cosmetics. And again, just in case you think we've gotten smarter over the years, uh, from the 1950s to the present day, there are spas that have been built in locations where there is radon gas. And then there is a, a, a school of thought thinking there's a beneficial treatment to certain ailments and illnesses by bathing in water that is exposed to uh, radium or exposing yourself to radon gas in small, low levels. And there's actually been papers both pro and against whether this was a, is a beneficial treatment or not for some conditions. So that comes to our, our, our modern times. As a society, especially here in the U.S., we have a perception that uh, our products are safe until we're proven otherwise. So most women who wear cosmetics we believe there's no toxic compounds in it. But if you go on the FDA's website who controls cosmetics, you'll find that there's, there's recalls all the time for a host of different consumer products, and cosmetics are definitely one of them. And they can be for any number of reasons, from physical contaminant to bacterial contamination or, or all sorts of a host of reasons. But we should be concerned because uh, basically the use of cosmetics is pretty much global and it generates hundreds of billion dollars of revenue for the companies, the manufacturers. So here in the U.S., the cosmetics are regulated by the FDA. There is no pre-market approval for the actual finished cosmetic, uh, but there are approvals and regulations on additives and colorants being used in cosmetics. There was a study, and this is a citation of HEP, that was up to three parts per million of lead that they had found in lipsticks. So we decided to take this study and expand it a little bit and look at other elements and re-examine some of the lipsticks for lead to see if our results would correspond with what was found in the previous study. We also wanted to see, are there any correlations between colors and particular elements uh, finish types, is a shine or a gloss or a pearlescent shade have a higher mineral or element content than some other, uh, some other type of lipstick. 
So we also wanted to look if there was any correlation between finish and color. In looking at just the basics of, of the chemistry of lipstick, you have at its heart a base. The most of the lipstick contains waxes or oils, castor oil being a, a particular oil that's used in, in cosmetics. You also have preservatives, uh, vitamins, some antioxidants. If the product has some sort of flavor to it, you have a flavor compound or flavor of products added to the, the lipstick. And then you also have finishing compounds that produce uh, the shine, the finish, the sparkle. And of course, you have your pigments and colors. The pigments and colors are broken down into basically organic and inorganic colorants. For the organic colorants, you have coal tar colorants. Now, these particular compounds must undergo safety testing prior to use in cosmetics. And they're the only ingredient um, restricted by the FDA and must be tested before use because they are potential carcinogens. The organic colorants are also broken down into different classifications. Um, two in particular are FD and C colors, which are safe for internal and external exposure. And then you have external D and C colors, which are for external use only. For the inorganic colorants, you have uh, compounds such as iron oxide black, iron oxide red, and a variety of other colors, orange, yellow, brown, and a manganese violet. These are examples of some of the colors that are used in lipstick to produce the different shades. In our study, we had 48 lip products that were donated by Specs employees. And they ranged in age from products that were fairly uh, brand new, never used, to products that had been used and had been sitting around for, for quite a while in, in their draw. Um, we didn't really put any emphasis on the products being new or unused, but we wanted to look at these older lipsticks to see if some of the, some of the bases and some of the preservatives broke down into components that would um, potentially be harmful or uh, might cause some degradation. So it, to us, at, this, at the time we collected the samples, it really didn't matter the age of the, the lipstick. And the price range of the lipsticks varied from about $5 a tube up to about $35 a tube. The majority of the samples were on the more expensive end, the more department store brands, uh, in the range of, I would say, about $20 to $35 a tube. And we covered about 14 brands of different lipsticks in this study. The products that we looked at had different physical type states. We had lip stains, we had some lip glosses, uh, lip balms, and the traditional lipstick. So overall, we had 48 samples. We had 11 berry and wine samples, seven uh, brown lipstick samples, three beige or tan lipstick samples, six white or colorless samples, uh, three light pink samples, seven dark pink samples, and 11 coral and peaches. We had four types of finishes that we grouped our lipstick samples into. Pearlescence, which had kind of a whitish or uh, a slightly opaque shine to them. We had mattes, which had like no shine components or no flecks of, of metallic or pearlescent essences in them. Metallic, which had a uh, small flecks of what appeared to be metal-like fragments. And then you had clear things like uh, bombs and glosses that had no, uh, that had translucency to them. We also had uh, three physical states of lipstick. We had a solid, like a solid lipstick tube, a semi-solid, which would be a gel-type lipstick or a spreadable type of lipstick. And then we also had liquid, like a lip stain. In preparing our samples, we use spec CERTIPREP standards. We used a whole range of spec CERTIPREP CLMS standards, so we could cover a wide range of different uh, compounds and elements. We did try to match the matrix and the composition of the lipstick, so we would avoid any interferences. So that's why we used many different uh, standards, and we mixed them in different proportions to try to simulate the, the percentages of the elements we were seeing. We also used our base oil 20 standard. 
For reagents, we used high purity reagents, high purity nitric acid, hydrofluoric acid, and boric acid solutions for our digestion. For sample preparation, we did uh, reference a previous work done in the Journal of Cosmetic Science, and here is the, the citation if anybody would, would like to look at the original work done. In that particular citation, the levels of lead were found to be up to 3 ppm in the lipstick samples they studied. For this sample pre preparation, we did use a, a CEM Mars microwave unit and XP1500 vessels in a two-step microwave digestion procedure. The two steps were, uh, the first step was intended to digest the material, and then the second step was to deactivate the hydrofluoric acid. For step one, we used 0.3 grams of sample, 7 mils of high purity nitric acid, 2 mils of high purity hydrofluoric acid, and then we ran a two-stage microwave program covering about 45 or so minutes, um, and then the samples were allowed to cool before moving on to the next step. The next step, we at introduced a 4% boric acid solution in order to, to deactivate the hydrofluoric, and then we ran a shorter uh, microwave program where we ramped up to 170 degrees C over 15 minutes to fully deactivate the hydrofluoric acid. The samples were then immediately diluted with water, and we did run digestion blanks uh, before and after the samples to clean our, out our microwave vessels and make sure there was no carryover from, from sample to sample. Then prior to ICPMS, the samples were then diluted up to 1,000x. For our instrumentation, uh, the very first step we did is we took a few um, characteristic lipstick samples and we digested them and ran them on our Perkin Elmer ICP OES to get an overall composition of what was in the lipstick sample, what, was, what were the large elements found in the lipstick sample. And this gave us a, a chance to go backwards then and then predict what type of standards and sample preparation additions or changes we would need to make in order to, to, to do a, a very complete uh, examination of our lipstick sample. We then continued on to ICPMS, and we used an Agilent ICPMS with a Meinhard nebulizer and a cyclonic spray chamber. We did perform the analysis by ICPMS under normal air mode and collision mode using helium. And the conditions for ICPMS are in our little table to the right. So we looked at a huge group of elements. Being a certified reference materials company, we do literally have the periodic table at our fingertips. So we uh, were able to make standards containing a very large uh, variety of elements, everything uh, from silver all the way down to zirconium. So we did have a very large group of, of elements that we were looking uh, for, and this table shows the, the different modes that we ran our samples in and the different lines that we examined or the, the best line that we examined for those particular elements. If we first just go to the trace elements that we found, uh, one of the more surprising and interesting little tidbits we found is there were some actual rare earth and precious metals found in small amounts. We did find silver and gold in about a quarter of a ppm and platinum in three quarters of a ppm. When we looked to see if these particular uh, rare earths or precious metals occurred in, uh, in any particular color or any particular finish, we did find that there were some correlations between color and the different precious metals. Um, silver was found in peach colors. So when we looked at our samples and sorted them by the uh, amounts of silver we found in it, we did find that the congregation of the silver was found in the peach colored lipsticks. And funny enough, it was found almost exclusively in one brand of, of lipstick. When we're looking at the gold, we found them mostly in berry and brown colors. And we did find small amounts of gold in, a, in a several different uh, brands of lipstick, but predominantly that one brand, and it was the same brand we found the silver in, had also had the gold in it. When it comes to platinums, we found those in white and brown. So kind of at the both ends of the spectrum, we found some platinum, but not really in the, the berry or red colors or pink colors. And again, predominantly one brand had the platinum, and it was the same brand that also had the gold and the silver. So one brand predominantly had all of the precious metals. 
And we did find a little bit of palladium in some of the berries and dark pink. When we look at the correlation of finishes, we found that the gold was in the metallics, but we did not find gold in any of the pearl shades. The converse was true with the silver. We found silver in the pearls, but not in the metallic shades. And iridium also we found in pearls, but not in metallic shades. If we look at the macro element composition of the lipstick, we found that there are some very high concentrations of some of the, the elements we really did expect. We expected to see iron and potassium, magnesium, silica, titanium. We expected to see some of these kind of backbone type of elements. Um, we had very high amounts of aluminum, almost 400,000 parts per million. In speaking with some cosmetic chemists, uh, they thought possibly that the aluminum was coming from some of the uh, backbones of the colorants, some of the lakes that were used in, in the lipstick. If we look at a breakdown of some of the colors and some of these macro elements, for aluminum, it, the highest results we got were in this berry color. So maybe this one particular set of berries from one or two of these uh, production manufacturers have a particular colorant that is based on aluminum platform. That, that's always a possibility. But there, in the berries, we had a very high uh, aluminum result. Also, with the berries had a very high calcium result. When it comes to iron, the more color the lipstick had, the higher amount of iron it seemed to have. And with the iron oxides in blacks and browns and yellows, it kind of makes sense that some of these uh, reds uh, and tans and browns are also high in iron. Potassium, again, we have in the berry colors a high amount of, of potassium. Uh, silica, we kind of saw more in the middle shade of ranges. The dark pinks, the corals, and the berries had some more silica. And there is actually was some more silica in the white than there were in the darker colors. So you get a little bit more in the, the whites and, the, and the, the glosses than you did in the darker, and the darker berries and the browns. And titanium, where you would think maybe they're higher in the whites, actually are, were pretty, pretty low in the whites. And you found more titanium in the colors. And not really much difference across the board as far as color. If we look at the magnesium, again, the, the purple or the uh, berry uh, pops out as having the highest result. And the manganese, it seems to creep up slowly with the darker the color. Um, you do see that manganese violet is one of the colorants that would produce, you know, reds, browns, and, and colors like that. So you kind of see that towards more towards the end of the, the darker color spectrum. Uh, zinc, there was no real correlation between a particular color. It kind of uh, fell back and forth between the color groups. And zirconium, you had a little bit higher in the white, and it's kind of hard to see. It's really getting close to our axis there. But the zirconium was actually uh, in the whites, the glosses, the shines, and, and, and things like that. So overall, the correlations with color, the darker the color, the higher overall concentrations of the different elements we found. For brown, we found high concentrations of copper, potassium, uh, selenium, magnesium, and Oh, sorry, manganese, and then we have found low uh, zirconium and low silica. For the berry colors, there was a whole host of, of, of high elements found in those berry colors, aluminum, calcium, silica, uh, zinc, copper, potassium, and so on. For the peaches and corals, we actually found a higher amount of tungsten uh, than found in the other colors, but we also found the lowest amounts of calcium were in the peach colors. And for the, the darker pinks, we found aluminum, calcium, silica, zinc, and phosphorus. And finally, when you look at the white, we found the high, higher zirconium level. If we look at the types of finish, we had the pearlescent finish. And the pearlescent finish did have um, a lot of the silicon and the magnesium, but did not have a lot of iron, potassium, and aluminum in it. For matte finishes, you found also the silica, but you also found higher levels of iron and zirconia and lower levels of aluminum and magnesium. For the metallic, you kind of have a little bit of converse of the matte and a little bit of a flip-flop, sort of like a synthesis of the pearls and, and the matte. You have magnesium and iron, aluminum and potassium. 
For the toxic elements, as we said before, the previous study of, uh, by HEP our, uh, had about 3 ppm, and our max was about 2.4 ppm. So we found it to be a fairly close correlation with what's been done before for lead levels. On average, we were about 1 ppm for our lead level. Looking at some of the other potentially toxic or hazardous elements, things like chromium and nickel, vanadium and antimony, um, we found chromium, this is total chrome, not chrome 6, total chromium of 31 ppm, nickel at 23 ppm max, vanadium at 51 ppm max, and antimony at 10 ppm max. On the good side, we found low levels of, we found low levels of cadmium, mercury, and uranium. So we found little to no of these very dangerous and potentially toxic compounds. If we want to look at the breakdown now, this is under 1 ppm of the potentially toxic elements. We had arsenic, and as the, the level or the, as the darkness of the color uh, increases, the arsenic also has some correlation to increasing with the highest arsenic levels being in the berries and the browns. For the beryllium, it's more of a kind of an even keel. There really isn't a significant difference uh, other than that the white colors have the lowest of the beryllium levels. For the cesium, it, the, the brown is actually has the highest level of, of trace elements. For the molly, it's uh, one of the pinks that have the highest concentration. And then for thallium, basically across the board, it's fairly even under 0.1 ppm. Now if we look at some of the potentially toxic elements under 10 ppm, we have cobalt where clearly the brown seems to be higher than some of the other colors. Uh, chromium, it, there wasn't a huge amount of correlation between uh, the, the darkness of the color other than the fact that the white again, were of the lowest concentration. If we look at some of the other compounds, we see that nickel um, had a strong correlation here with this brown color and a somewhat of a, of a darker pink color. Lead across the board was pretty even, and the lowest result being, again, in the, the colorless or white lipstick. Antimony had a, a large result or a larger result in the uh, dark pink. And tungsten, and as we said before, the, the corals or the light pinks had a, had a higher tungsten. If we look at the toxic elements that are under 100 ppm, we had tin with a, a fairly strong uh, correlation with the, the peach colors. There was an amount of tin there. And strontium with a correlation with some high results for the, the berry colors. And then finally, vanadium, there was a somewhat increase in vanadium with the berries and the brown colors. Again, the higher the concentration seemed to appear in the darker colors. So you had vanadium and arsenic being higher in the brown colors, as well as in the berry colors. And the berry also had a higher strontium level. For the peaches and the pinks, you'll see that there was a Lead was actually found in those peaches and pinks, and you do see some thallium in the, the peach color. If we look at the correlations with finish, the pearlescents have a lead factor in them. So you, when we looked at them by finish type, there was more lead in the pearlescent than the other types of finishes. And they also had the least amount of nickel in the pearlescent finishes. The mats had the most nickel, so they didn't have the lead, but they had a higher amount of nickel in them. And metallics, again, were kind of a mixed bag. They had, a, uh, had the lead and the nickel. So what does this mean to us as lipstick wearers or, or wives, husbands, and, or mothers of lipstick wearers? Well, the EPA and the World Health Organization looks at human exposure in the terms of their uh, reference dosage levels or their tolerable daily intake levels. And this is based mostly on, on food and water, but it's the exposure or the daily exposure to the human population that is likely to be without an appreciable risk of deleterious effects during a lifetime. And this is expressed in milligrams per kilogram of body weight per day. 
In our previous uh, studies, when we had done things like pet food, um, some of our take-home messages were, uh, while the concentrations in the actual samples might be small, the overall exposure rate made it um, a problematic for some of the compounds that we found. Uh, the converse is kind of true. Some of the concentrations are high in the PPM levels, the high PPM or low PPM levels, but the exposure rate is very, very small when it comes to lipstick. This is a, a little chart comparing different uh, EPA or WHO RFD values and showing what our concentrations in, we found in the different lipstick of the different elements. Uh, we figured that about an application of lipstick was about 100 micrograms at most. And then in speaking with a, a group of women, we want to know, OK, on, on the most, um, the heaviest use day, what would be the most you would wear for lipstick? How many times would you reapply it? So we sat down and tried to average what uh, a very heavy application of lipstick would be. And we came up that it's about six to 10 applications a day of about 100 micrograms or more would give you about a tenth of a gram of total of lipstick in a day. So we calculated at the worst case scenario of some of these toxic elements, what a tenth of a gram of lipstick would give you in terms of exposure. And then we wanted to see how much lipstick you would actually have to consume in order to violate your RFD uh, recommendations. And something like arsenic, you would have to consume 334 grams of lipstick. And considering a tube of lipstick is about three grams, you'd be over 100 tubes of lipstick. Uh, for something like lead, you would have to consume 111 to 111 grams, which is roughly 30 or so tubes of lipstick. To kind of put this in a nice, interesting graphic, we decided to kind of break it down. So the uh, highest concentration we found of a potentially toxic element of barium, you basically have to consume a quarter of a tube of lipstick. So you would, that's not apply a quarter of a tube. You'd actually have to consume a quarter of a tube of lipstick. So you would probably have to apply a whole lot more than a quarter of a tube in order to be exposed to it. For antimony, you basically would have to eat a tube of lipstick in order to violate the RFD value. Uh, for thallium, you better get ready to chow down on about 11 tubes of lipstick. Now, if you're concerned about mercury and lead, which really spurred our study was the lead, um, some poor woman would have to consume close to 40 tubes of lipstick in order to violate the lead level. And like I said, this is not applying 40 tubes of lipstick. This is actually you consuming 40 tubes of lipstick. For arsenic, you have 111 tubes of lipstick you're going to have to consume. And for cadmium, it's close to 600. So if we think about the average tube of lipstick of a fairly nice lipstick being about $10 for the sake of argument, you're close, spending close to $6,000 in one day to violate your cadmium level for the lipsticks that we found. So overall, what did we find? We found that Basically, there are a lot of elements present in lipstick, whether they're colorants, uh, they're byproducts, they're uh, contaminants, they're just naturally occurring. There is a whole wide range of elements found in lipstick. When it comes to the toxic elements, particularly lead, we did find up to 2 ppm of lead in lipstick, which did correlate quite well with the previous study that showed up to 3 ppm of lip, uh, lead in lipstick. On the good side, though, we found very low PPB levels or non-existent levels of mercury and cadmium and uranium. So that was a very good finding. Uh, we also found there's a lot of aluminum. So if there's aluminum sensitivity or concern about aluminum exposure, there is a lot of aluminum, in, especially in the berries and the dark pink shades of, of lipstick. And as we said before, the highest concentrations of elements were found in the darker colors. So the darker the lipstick, the more potential exposure to different colorants and different metals. And of course, the, that means the light colors, the glosses and the bombs, had the lowest concentration. But overall, your exposure rate to toxic elements is minutely small. And again, you would have to eat, you would have to eat and consume the lipstick in order for it to really take uh, any effect on, on your health. I would like to thank all the employees at Spec CertiPrep and Sample Prep for their donations of their lipstick. And I would also like to thank the analysts and the chemists who worked on this project, uh, Hui Fang Lang, Lazo Ernier, Bill Driscoll, and our VP of Inorganics, Vanaja Sivukumar.
And for anyone who wants to read the original study that uh, we based our study upon, it's cited down below here in the Journal of Cosmetic Science. Thank you, Pat, again, for another wonderful presentation. I'm going to open up the floor now for any questions. Um, if you have any questions, just submit them into the question box on your screen. Um, also, I have here with us uh, Hui Fang Wang, who is a chemist at uh, Specs, uh, to answer any questions that might be related to you know, the method that uh, we use for the study. We have a, a question here. Was there any correlation with levels of country of origin? Honestly, we did not look at country of origin or manufacture of the lipsticks. Um, that would be an interesting uh, study to do. Um, to be honest, uh, it's not even something that actually occurred to us to, to think of the country of origin in our, in our analysis of the lipstick. Did we analyze any dollar store makeup? Um, one of the, the conditions of the, this lipstick study was that we accepted donations basically from our employees and our employees donated very expensive brands of makeup. Um, so I guess a lot of our employees are shopping at the department stores for their makeup rather than some of the other chain and retail stores because most of the makeup that we received was high-end makeup, makeup that you would be spending 20 or $60 more uh, to purchase. Do we have any other questions? Um, was there any contamination because the products weren't new? We don't, uh, didn't look at any bacterial contamination of our products. We were planning on uh, following up with a study on the breakdown products of some of these bases and colorants, uh, which did not, was, was not accomplished uh, while we were doing this study. Maybe, like I said, for the future, we'll come back to that and decide to do it again. Um, but uh, we tried to eliminate any inorganic contamination by wiping down the lipsticks first, uh, making sure that we kind of dug into the center of the lipstick so that we weren't using necessarily the surface areas of, of the lipstick. So we tried to, to deal with contamination in, in that respect. Um, why was hydrofluoric acid used in lipstick digestion? Uh, do you want to talk about hydrofluoric acid, we? <clears throat> You know, for, to answer this question, you can find that from the publication uh, Patty cited in his slides. So that slide the, has the publication for Journal of the Cosmetics. There is a detailed explanation why HF has been, hydrofluoric acid has been used instead of any other acid, like sulfuric acid or HCl, because we don't want metal precipitate out when we're using uh, sulfuric acid or HCl. And also uh, hydrofluoric acid works pretty well. A lot of metals can stay in solution and also can completely destroy the base, the wax or whatever the base. That's why. So if you want to know the detail, go check up the citation. Well, here, here's another question. This is actually uh, something that came up uh, in, in the previous webinar. Um, Somebody asked if it was strange to find some precious metals and things like rare earth iridium in our lipstick sample. So I'll have you answer uh, that question too. Well, yeah. When we analyzed uh, iridium, when we analyzed uh, lipstick samples, we did see a couple of samples has a precious metal iridium. We feel surprised too. We saw it uh, from the beginning. We saw that from the ICP reading. Then we, we saw that in the ICP map too. We thought it's because of the dilution factor. So in order to uh, verify it is because of the dilution factor or this iridium precious metal do exist in the lipstick samples. So we did mimic the lipstick a combination of the metals and we use them spiking the precious metals as a standard. So we use that standard. We check the number of the, iridium, uh, the lipstick samples. We did verify, yes, for some samples of lipstick, this precious matter do exist in the product. What was also interesting is in the digestion of the particular samples, um, they were not grouped by brand. So we didn't like do a digestion of one brand and then the other brand. But when we did the examination of the lipstick samples, 
uh, these precious metals did tend to be in one particular brand. So it's not as if one batch of a digestion was uh, contaminated or had any, uh, any contamination of, of precious metals in it. All right, I think that's basically all we have for the questions right now. I know, Matt, you wanted to say a few more things? Okay, I just have a few announcements uh, before I let you guys go. Um, if you haven't received a copy of our 2011-2012 catalog, um, it's available on our website. You can request a hard copy, a CD, or you can download the PDF uh, straight to your computer. Also new in 2011 is um, a standard uh, designed for use with uh, USP 232, um, elemental impurities in pharmaceuticals and nutraceuticals. Um, if you'd like more information, uh, visit our website, specsodaprep.com. Uh, SpecSodaPrep is also a social. Um, follow us on all your favorite social networking sites to receive updates on webinars and future events. Also, all of our previous webinars are available to view on demand on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash specsodaprep. Once again, I'd like to say thanks to Pat for providing yet again another uh, wonderful presentation. And I'd like to thank everyone who attended. Um, we hope to see you in a future webinar. Thank you.